Um, um, on this today will be Michael Kapiloff, who will be telling us about approximating max count. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting as well. It's very nice to be here. So I will uh, talk about our recent work that gives an optimal space lower bound for approximating max cut. This is joint work with uh, Dmitry Krachun, who's at the University of Geneva. Okay, so this talk is about graph algorithms that use a small amount of space. The reason why we're interested is the fact that modern graphs are large and they usually do not fit into the memory of a single compute node, so we're interested in designing small space algorithms for graphs, and in particular in understanding limitations of small space algorithms for graphs. So these limitations are exactly what this talk is about. Okay, so this is about small space algorithms for graph problems. The standard way of thinking about these uh, algorithms is to think about the streaming model of computation, also known as the graph streaming or the semi-streaming model of computation. So here our input is a graph G, has n vertices and m edges, and the edge set of the graph is revealed to the algorithm one edge at a time. Uh, these are provided in a worst case order. Now as the algorithm is scanning the stream, it is constrained in space usage. It can only use O tilde n space, so n polylog n space. Think of uh, being able to store, say, a small num a smallish number of spanning trees, but not, not much more than that. Now, as the algorithm is scanning the stream, uh, at the, uh, it's maintaining this small space representation, and at the end of the day, uh, the algorithm must output the answer. So in this talk, we're interested in single-pass algorithms, so I take a single pass over the edge stream. Okay, so this space requirement of n poly log n is a, is a very natural upper bound to ensure. Um, the reason is that for many fundamental graph problems, omega n space is uh, needed. For instance, if, even if I want to check if my graph is connected, even though my outputs, uh, output size is one bit, I still need a linear amount of space. In some settings, uh, the, even the object that I'm trying to compute is omega n size, so it's natural that omega n space is needed. That's why n poly log n space upper bound for semi-streaming is quite reasonable. On the other hand, Many graphs are actually sparse in real life, so it would be very nice to, de to design algorithms that operate in this truly sublinear regime, namely use space sublinear in the number of vertices, in the number of vertices of the graph. And uh, over the past few years, uh, we, um, so there has been a lot of work on designing such algorithms. So we know that, for instance, we can approximate matching size in random order streams uh, using uh, a very small amount of space, approximate the number of components, a uh, number of connected components in a graph using a, exactly a very small amount of space. And we want to understand for which other graph problems one can design algorithms that approximate the solution cost in truly sublinear, that is, little of n space. Now, in this talk, I'm interested in the max cut problem. So let me remind you. Uh, we're given a graph G, so here's uh, this graph pictured on the slide, and the task is to find a cut that maximizes the number of edges that cross it. For this particular graph G on the slide, this cut here is optimal. It cuts all the edges but one, and the graph contains a triangle, so it's not bifurcated. Um, okay, well, what do we know about approximating max cut? Now, first, let's, let's see, what do we know about it in the RAM model of computation? For instance, <coughs> a random cut cuts half of the edges in the graph, this gives us a trivial factor two approximation. Just count the number of edges in the graph, I'll put that much by two. We can do better using Gilman's Williamson. This uh, gives about a 1.14 approximation. It is also possible to do better than two, better than this trivial, um, uh, trivial approximation factor using spectral techniques. For instance, the work of Travis and Kali and Sashadri and uh, Soto. Okay, so these are offline algorithms for approximating max cut. What exactly does this tell us about streaming? So how can you implement them in the streaming model? Well, first, this uh, trivial factor two approximation immediately carries over to the streaming setting. Well, indeed, uh, using just the logarithmic amount of space, I can count the number of edges in the graph and then output that much by two. So that's a trivial factor two. On the other hand, if I want a good approximation to max cut, I can actually get an arbitrarily good approximation, one plus epsilon approximation, in space roughly linear in the number of nodes just sample about n over epsilon squared edges uniformly at random from the graph, find the max cut value there. So note that I'm interested in the value, not in the cut itself, and I want, to, I want my algorithm to run in little of n space. Now this is of course not efficient, but uh, it gives a one plus minus epsilon approximation in small, smallish space. Good, so the question that I'm interested in is, well here we have these two extremes, trivial factor two in log space, and uh, one plus epsilon in about linear space. Do non-trivial algorithms exist that s somehow fit in between these two extremes? 
Yes. So here you don't really want the thing to be deterministic for uh, your fine with randomized. Oh yes, yes. Uh, we're definitely fine with randomized algorithms. Yeah. Good. So we want to understand if there exist non-trivial algorithms for approximating max cut in the single pass streaming model. And the main result of this uh, work is that uh, they essentially do not. Okay. Good. So this problem, in fact, has been studied over the past few years. There have been quite a lot of works. And uh, progressively, um, somewhat less optimistic questions have been uh, asked uh, about the space complexity of this problem. So for instance, question one uh, was asked in about 2014. Uh, perhaps uh, there, exists, uh, there exists good approximation algorithms uh, that use, let's say, polylogarithmic space, similarly to approximating matching size. Well, it turns out the answer is no, because even if better than factor two requires square root and space, this was proved, uh, proven by uh, myself, Khan and Sudan, and uh, Kogan and Krothgammer, uh, roughly at the same time. Now, this left over the question of, uh, perhaps there is, uh, so to speak, an approximation scheme. Namely, for any approximation factor alpha between one and two, maybe there is some beta such that I can get an alpha approximation and enter the beta space. Maybe beta goes to one as alpha goes to one. This turned out to be not possible. This is the work of uh, myself, uh, Tana Sudan and Bellinger from SODA 17. Uh, but this still left over the possibility of there existing some magical constant alpha star, perhaps the Gunnels Williamson constant, uh, such that uh, you can uh, uh, get an alpha star approximation in some n to the beta star space, which is strongly sublinear, sort of less than n. Uh, less than n. Um, and what we show in this work is that uh, this, this is not possible. <laughs> what we show is that uh, any better than factor two requires linear space. From the point of view of new techniques, uh, substantially a lot more is needed to get from question two to question three than to get from question one to question two. Okay, good. So let me now formally state our result. We show that for any constant epsilon bigger than zero, any single pass, uh, sort of possibly randomized <coughs> streaming algorithm that approximates max cut value to a factor of two minus epsilon requires linear space. Specifically, the amount of space needed is uh, omega of n divided by 1 over epsilon to the order 1 over epsilon squared. So there's some exponential dependence on 1 over epsilon squared, and we'll talk about this in more detail later. Okay. So this essentially settles the uh, streaming complexity of uh, single pass uh, algorithms for approximating max cut. And well, the main innovation that lets us get the result is uh, a set of new techniques for, com uh, for, for proving communication complexity lower bounds via Fourier analysis. Okay, so there are no good algorithms for max cut in the, in the single pass setting. At the same time, it does seem quite plausible that if for, if, for example, we allow ourselves a logarithmic number of passes, then uh, space about square root n, or actually a little bit better than that, seems entirely, entirely plausible. It would be very nice to construct such algorithms. Okay, uh, yes. Because, I mean, like some of the, uh, the, the results that go better than two, they, they do random walks. Yes. So you simulate the random walks by multiple buses, right? Yes, that's exactly what I have in mind. So really what I want to say is that sort of suppose that we make this a random order assumption so that at least I can do logarithmic length random walks. That's, right. what, that's why I want it. I, I think it's, it seems plausible, although it's uh, definitely not clear how to get it, uh, that uh, you can beat factor two in some sublinear, uh, sublinear space. That would be very interesting. Okay, good. So this is the main result. Now let me tell you how we get there. If we, we establish the theorem by uh, analyzing, uh, defining and analyzing a hard distribution on input instances. So it looks like this. Our distribution is based on random graphs. They're almost like erdos renyi graphs, but not quite. So uh, there will be a yes case and a no case. And the yes, yes. Is there any upper bound that says you can get, I don't know, like 2 minus 1 over log n approximation in strongly sublinear? Uh, 2 minus 1 over log n approximation? Two minus I see. Uh, good. So, so this uh, lower bound would uh, would rule out. Yeah. No. No. I, I don't, I'm not aware of any lower any upper bound of this type uh, this type for single pass algorithms. No. No. Good. Um, yeah. So our proof, as I will show, is actually fairly tight for the communication complexity problem. But we. Yeah. But for general graphs, uh, I, I'm not aware of such a result. Good. So here's the hard input distribution. There's a yes case. Uh, and in the yes case, our algorithm will be presented with a random bipartite uh, graph with expected degree about 1 over epsilon squared. So as epsilon goes to 0, the expected degree gets large. In the no case, it will be a, a random non-bipartite uh, graph with expected degree 1 over epsilon squared. 
Technically, it's a multigraph, but the edge multiplicities are no more than uh, two with extremely high probability. And the number of double edges is order one over, one over epsilon squared. So there's almost none of them. Good. So what we will show is that, uh, well, in the yes case, max cut value is all the edges in the graph because it's a bipartite graph. In the no case, because the graph is dense enough, or we will need this uh, one over the average degree to be one over epsilon squared to be large enough. The max cut value is one plus order epsilon times a half of the number of edges. So the graph is almost half, uh, one, one half uh, far from being bipartite, half minus epsilon. So good. So then uh, a better than two minus epsilon factor approximation to max cut must disting distinguish between these two cases. So it's enough to concentrate on proving that no, uh, no algorithm with uh, less than linear space can distinguish between the two. Okay, how do we, so what do these graphs look like? Well, as I mentioned, it's important that in the no case, the graph is dense enough. That's because we want the max cut gap to be large enough. On, on the other hand, how should this graph be presented in the stream? In both cases, the stream is naturally partitioned into capital T, which is roughly one over epsilon squared phases. And in every phase, what we see is, is a uniformly, is a random matching both in the yes case and in the no case, locally the graph is very sparse and, max, and, and sparse and bipartite. It's just a random match. So here's a pictorial representation. Um, the input stream will be uh, partitioned into about one over epsilon squared phases, and in every phase we get a random matching of size alpha n. Uh, alpha is some small constant. Okay, so here's what the stream looks like. As I said, locally, Mm, and if, if we look at any fixed chunk, so every fixed, any fixed phase of the stream, then both in the yes and in the no cases, we will see a uniformly random matching, except the matchings in the yes case are correlated. In fact, there is a uniformly random bipartition of the graph that is sampled at first, and then every matching that we get, in fact, matches vertices on one side of the bipartition to vertices on the other side of the bipartition. In the no case, there is no correlation. And these, you can think of this as just resampling the bipartition uh, in every phase. Okay, so in the yes case, this is a bipartite graph, and in the no case, this graph is far from bipartite. Well, we want to prove that no small space algorithm uh, separates, uh, can, can distinguish between the two. It is natural to prove this, uh, prove this bound by considering a T-party communication problem. So there are T players corresponding to the phases in the stream, and every player, after receiving the corresponding graph, posts a message, MI, uh, on the board, and uh, the board is, uh, is, 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 is visible to all the players. Now, the last player at the end of the stream must announce the answer. Are we in the yes case or are we in the no case? Good. Now, it is not so easy to reason about compressing graphs, so instead we reason about compressing, uh, define a different communication problem, and reason about compressing bit, string, bit strings. So let me tell you about this problem. So that's the implicit, uh, implicit hidden partition problem introduced in uh, our work in SOTA 17. The problem is as follows. So this is, uh, this is a problem which is a relative of the Boolean hidden matching problem. So there will be T players, uh, player one through player T, and uh, every player receives two pieces of input. The first piece of input is a graph. So player one gets G1, here's the graph, with labels W1 on the edges of G1. So here are the labels shown in red. Player, the, the graphs are public. As soon as the player receives the graph, the graph is posted on a board. The bits, the labels, are private. So the player looks at the labels and writes down some message on the board that depends on the labels. This goes on for t rounds, and then the teeth player must distinguish between the two cases. In the yes case, there exists a bipartition of the graph, that is, a zero one labeling of the vertices, such that the labels that we observe on the edges are consistent with that bipartition. So for in, in particular, the label of, on an edge uv is just xu plus xv, the labels on the two vertices, mod 2. Another way of saying this is the, in the yes case, the edges that, that have ones written on them are exactly the edges that go from one side of the bipartition to the other, and the ones with zero are the complement. So we can uh, write this as wt, the labels are just m to mt times x, so where mt is the edge incidence matrix of the graph. Okay, and in the no case, no such partition exists. Yes? Sorry, so the messages are on a board, so does the last player, they can see the message of the first player and the second player? Yes, that is correct. The messages are on the board. Yeah, the graphs are on the board, and the messages are on the board. 
so you don't lose anything by considering that model compared to one where like uh, like a tree protocol where like you cannot see things. right um, one could potentially lose uh, but uh, one could potentially lose but the number of phases is only one over epsilon squared and the lower bound is actually n over one over epsilon to the one over epsilon squared so this is not really important yeah. okay Good, so this is the problem. And uh, so it is important here that this partition x is never given to any player. And that's why it's the implicit hidden partition. Good, so we use the following distributional version of this problem. So here the uh, bipartition x is chosen uniformly at random. And uh, then the game with probability a half is in the yes case, with probability a half is in the no case. The distribution of the graphs that the players are given are as follows. So the graphs g1 through gt are simply random matchings. So here's a pictorial representation of the graphs. So let's say the first player gets a uniformly random matching. It's the red player, so it gets the red matching. The second player, and of course together with bits on the edges, the second player gets, again, a uniformly random matching, say the blue matching. But it's a uniformly random one, so it's better to draw it like this. Um, then the third player again gets a matching, so the black player got this black matching. And let's say the fourth player gets one other matching. So if you put these matchings together, you get a graph that somewhat resembles an urge train you graph above the giant component threshold. That's, that's why we choose, them, uh, choose the average degree to be 1 over epsilon squared. Good. So okay. Did you, did you say that the graph was actually going to be revealed to all the players? You said something about the graph is written on the board. What Good, the yes. Uh, the, graphs, uh, the graph is indeed written on the board. Uh, so as soon as the teeth player gets, the, gets their input, the teeth graph, so the teeth matching is written on the board. So it is important that uh, player T does not know a graph T plus one. So basically, uh, th they know all the graphs in retrospect. Do you repeat that in uh, so basically, uh, as soon as the teeth player gets a graph, as, uh, gets, gets their chunk of the input, uh, what do they get? They get a graph GT, which is nothing but a random matching. So this matching is posted on the board in its entirety. Uh, and then there's also the private input, which is the bits on the edges. Uh, these bits are not, of course, posted. Uh, then the, the player compresses the bits and posts the message. So in particular, when the player does that, the player can adapt to all the graphs, g1 through gt. Starts first. Hmm? Player t starts first. Uh, no, no, player 1 starts first. OK, can you repeat what order the odd graphs are created, what order the messages are sent? Good. So uh, let's see. Good. So there are, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a t player game. Uh, we start with player 1. Player 1 gets a graph G1. The graph is immediately posted on the board. Uh, the labels, the labels are compressed and posted on the board. Then player 2 gets G2. It's posted on the board. So in particular, the teeth player can adapt to all the graphs and all the messages on the board. So, uh, so far, you have not mentioned how do you create essentially the string out of this? Yes, I have not. So that's exactly what I'm about to do. <laughs> Excellent. Good. So uh, what does this have to do with max cut? What does this problem have to do with max cut? Let me tell you how to create the stream. I promise to you that we'll, in the yes case, we'll create a random bipartite graph. And in the no case, we'll create a random non bipartite graph. How do we do that? Well, every teeth player, when they receive the corresponding graph GT, uh, looks at the labels and constructs a graph GT prime that contains all the edges that have one written on them. OK, so in the yes case, all the labels that we saw were consistent with some bipartition. So the edges that have ones written on them are exactly the ones that cross the cut, just like this edge here, 0 to 1. And so the union of these graphs gt prime is bipartite. In the no case, the labels were uniformly random. So what the players uh, did was basically just take a union of random matching, matchings and then su subsample the edges independently at rate a half. So this is the distribution. OK, good. Uh, so what we show is that the corresponding graphs g prime that are created, or in the yes case it's bipartite, in the no case it's actually a half minus epsilon far from bipartite. This is uh, almost by churn of bounds. One needs to be a little bit careful because you have matchings, so there's correlations. Good. So at this point we have the reduction. So we need to prove, uh, we need to un understand the complexity of the implicit hidden partition problem. So and what we show is that any t-player protocol that gets a constant advantage over random guessing for the implicit hidden partition problem must use at least n divided by t to the order t communication. And remember, t was one of epsilon squared, so this recovers the original. Okay. Um, good. <clears throat> 
So it's interesting to note that uh, here we have an exponential dependence on t, and it might, might look weak. In reality, as I will show in a, in a few minutes, uh, there do exist protocols for this problem with uh, complexity n over a constant to the t. So this is uh, potentially a little bit weak, and it's, we might know how to remove this weakness, but uh, it's better. We, we prefer not to do this because the analysis is easier. OK, good. So in the remaining time, I would like to talk about the, uh, explain the main ideas behind the proof of the theorem. Now, before I tell you how we analyze the implicit hidden partition problem for general protocols, I would like to give some intuition. I would like to start, with, uh, start by designing some simple protocols for this implicit hidden partition problem and see how they perform. OK, so here's the problem. We have a number of players. And for simplicity, let's say we have four players. So there's the red player, the blue player, the black player, and the orange player. So each player gets a uniformly random matching. Here they are overlaid. Uh, the, the union of the matchings is on the slide. Uh, the players also get bits on the edges of the matchings. These bits are not shown here. So what is, uh, what is a natural protocol for this? So what is the goal of the players? The players want to know if these bits are consistent with some bipartition or if these bits are uniformly random. So I claim that here is a very simple protocol for this problem. Every player, when they get the corresponding matching, somehow decides on which edges the player wants to convey information about. And it will be a 0, 1 protocol in the sense that we choose some, subs some subset of edges, and we convey the bits on those edges, and we convey nothing about the bits on the rest of the edges. Okay. And I claim that we'll, show, we'll call these edges revealed edges. And I claim that if at the end of the day our players put together the revealed edges, if the set of revealed edges contains a cycle, then the players get advantage over random guessing. Let me convince you that this is the case. So here's an example. Let's say the red player got this red matching as input, and now here are the bits. Uh, we are in the yes case. We're only thinking about the yes case in this case. Um, so here on the vertices of the graph, I have this, uh, the, the bits corresponding to the random bipartition, and the edges of the red matchings, uh, matching are labeled according. But just one thing. Still, I didn't get the hot. How do we get these graphs that are coming in the stream? Like the first uh, graph for the first player is coming first, and then the second graph. Yes. And what are the zero, one? Only the one edges are coming, or zero edges are coming? Only the one edges are coming, yes. So basically, if I want to, yeah, if, you, if your question is how do you create the stream out of this communication problem, you just filter. In the communication problem, you get a random matching. You just sort of filter the matching. You keep only those edges that have ones. Uh, in the graph or in the matching? No, no. So, uh, there is, in the communication problem, every player gets a matching with a bit. Yes. You keep only those edges that have ones written on them, and you feed them into your streaming algorithm. OK, and ignore all other. Yeah, I can throw away the rest. OK, so here's the first red player. And uh, the player looks at the edges and somehow decides that uh, the player wants to keep these two edges. They're shown in bold. And the corresponding bits are posted on the board. Uh, the other bits are just forgotten. Very nice. So now the uh, blue player comes in, uh, gets the random matching. Here it is. Decides to keep these two bold edges. And the other bits are forgotten. And now the black player comes in and decides to keep something. So maybe this one, uh, one black edge with the corresponding bit. And finally, the orange player comes in, uh, looks, uh, looks at this, and decides maybe to keep these bold orange edges. OK. There. So now if we look at this picture, the the bold edges are the ones that we transmitted information over. And we notice that there is a four cycle. There's a cycle that contains this black edge, this uh, blue, orange, and, and, uh, and, uh, and red. So now if we are in the yes case, then if I sum up the bits on these edges, I get a 0. Because we, in the yes case, the edge has a 1 written on it if it crosses this hidden bipartition. And I'm walking around a cycle, so if I come back to the origin, I crossed it an even number of times. On the other hand, if we were in the no case, then over any set of edges, the bits add up to plus 0 or 1 with equal probability. They're uniformly random. So if the players create a cycle, then they can solve the problem. Good. All right, so that's a simple class of protocols. Now let's, uh, let's try to figure out, I, I said somehow they choose some subset of edges to, to convey the information over. Let's look at concrete examples. Which edges should we, should we use? Um, so here's a very simple strategy. The simple strategy is this. The players 
remember that the, the union of the matchings is, is, looks essentially like a Erdős-Renyi graph. Suppose that the players just look at a subgraph of this graph, so they, 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 they look at the vertices with labels between one and something, and decide to keep only those edges that have both endpoints in this special set. So here, here are these uh, vertices uh, shaded in cyan, and uh, a very natural protocol is just keeping the edges that have both endpoints in this set. The players are basically hoping that a fixed induced subgraph of this erdos renyi graph uh, will have a cycle. Well, every player also should not convey too many edges, and one can do some cal computations to figure out under which conditions on the communication complexity of the players, the players will be able to detect a cycle. And a pretty simple calculation that is basically computing the expected degree in this induced subgraph and noting that you will get a cycle as long as the graph is above the giant component threshold suggests that with this type of protocol, I will be able to detect a cycle only when the communication uh, per player is bigger than n over t squared, so n over poly t. t was the number of players. But on the other hand, what we should, our result seems, uh, the lower bound seems weaker in, in the light of this. Now, in fact, the truth is that this protocol is very weak. This is not a very good uh, protocol to have in mind when one thinks about uh, lower bounds for this problem. So let me give you a better one. So this is just not a very good way of uh, figuring out which edges to keep. The problem with this protocol is that it's non-adaptive. Let's consider a very natural adaptive scheme. We call it the adaptive component growing protocol. And this protocol will, in fact, be a very good very good, uh, good model for the actual lower bound proof. One can think of the lower bound proof as basically um, showing that this is essentially, the, essentially the, the best you can do. OK, so again, we have these T players. And uh, our players will maintain forests, Ft. So let Ft be the forest formed by the edges that are revealed by the players by time t. So recall that as soon as they get a cycle, the game is over. The, the players won the game. So that's why we're thinking about the forests. And now the teeth player will do the following. The teeth player will look at the forest ft minus 1. And uh, the teeth player has a budget of s bits. This player will look at the forest and reveal, all the, uh, reveal the edges that actually have at least one endpoint incident on, uh, on vertices that are in the forest in non-trivial components. And uh, of course, uh, the player will stop doing this when they run out of budget. So here's an example. So note that this is very adaptive. So let me do an example. So let's say the first player, the red player, got this red matching. I'm not showing the bits anymore because this is more about the edges at this point. So we look at this red matching. And at this point, there is no ft minus 1. f0 was empty. So the player just selects two edges to keep. Very good. So now the blue player comes in and gets this blue matching. OK. Suppose the player has a budget of two edges. So the player will keep those uh, edges that, uh, that have um, who, such that at least one endpoint is incident on the forest constructed so far. So the player will keep, let's say, this edge and this edge because they intersect with the red ones. So they're growing the components faster. Now the black player comes in, uh, gets a matching, and uh, actually keeps something. But at this point, they already have a triangle. Here's a triangle. OK. Good. Good. So note that so this is an adaptive process where every time the players have, uh, at, at time t, the players are looking at a forest ft minus 1, and then a random matching comes in. If at least one of the edges of the matching falls, so it has both endpoints inside, the, uh, inside one of the connected components in the forest, the game is over. There is a cycle, and the players win. So I want to understand, suppose that at time t, the sizes of non-trivial connected components in my forest are denoted by ci. What is the probability that the next matching creates a cycle? Well, a simple calculation shows that this is the sum of squares of component sizes. And this makes sense, because for two components, uh, for, for, for every component ci, the probability that an edge falls into it is about some ci size of ci squared divided by, uh, by, by, uh, by n. So the sum of squares really governs, uh, governs the process. So the interesting question to ask is, for this particular uh, protocol, how does this, uh, how does this um, sum of squares of component sizes evolve? And again, 
a certain amount of con contemplation reveals that uh, these component sizes get to grow exponentially because in every round you pretty much get a perfect matching and uh, you can double uh, the size of a component, not really double, but multiply it by some constant factor. And yet another calculation shows that this means that if you start with a budget which is only n divided by something exponential in the number of players, after t steps you will be able to find a cycle if you are adaptive. Okay, very good. It turns out that uh, one can also show that this protocol cannot solve the problem with more than n divided by something exponential in t communication. And the way to do it is to consider a potential function, which is nothing but the sum of squares of component sizes. One can show that not only can one grow this potential function exponentially, it actually cannot be grown more than exponentially in one round, in, in t rounds. Good. Okay. Very nice. So now equipped with these observations, let's see how we can port them uh, to an actual uh, lower bound for general protocols. So let me remind you what the problem is. Again, our problem is there's a uniformly random partition, and then we have t players. Each player gets a random matching with labels on the edges. And we want to know if these labels are uniformly random or they are, um, uh, or they are consistent with some bipartition. So Michael? Yes. So this example that you showed for this protocol, if my goal was to prove a lower bound for the problem of finding a short cycle in this distribution, not... So so uh -huh. my communication is problem, you give me this distribution, I just have to find a short cycle. Okay. Oh, so you don't want to say yes and no, you want... Yes, you I just need to. Right. Then is that an easier problem to prove a lower Ooh. bound? Or? I see, I see. I, I'm, I don't think it would be tremendously easy. I wouldn't really know how to do it very quickly. Uh, this, because this protocol uh, makes a serious assumption, it assumes that every player either, con either conveys the entire bit about the edge or nothing. So maybe there's a better way of solving your problem by sort of doing fractional things. Good. Okay. So let's consider our distribution with four players. And uh, this is what we want to understand. Suppose that uh, players one, two, and three have spoken. And now the, the, the last player, player 4, is getting this random matching with the bits. What do we want to show? We want to show that even conditioned on the messages from players 1, 2, and 3, the distribution of the labels on the fourth player's random matching is close to uniform. So, well, this random by partition used to be uniform, before the player spoke, was uniform in the Boolean cube. Now conditioned on the message from player 1, and now player 1 gets to use arbitrary protocols. So conditioned on the message of player 1, uh, this x is, uh, the bipartition is uniformly random in some subset of the cube. Conditioned on the message from player 2 is uniformly random in some uh, blue subset, and in the corresponding orange subset from player 3. Conditioned on all of them, uh, x is uniformly random in the, in the, in the intersection of these, of these three sets. So I call these sets A1, A2, and A3. And these sets have cannot have small density in the Boolean cube most of the time because uh, their density is at least 2 to the minus s, where s is the communication. Okay, uh, so let f1, f2, f3 be the indicator functions of a1, a2, a3 respectively. So here, in order to bound the distance between the distribution of m4 times x and the uniform distribution, we use Fourier techniques that were uh, pioneered in the work of Gavinsky, Kempe, Kerenidis, and Raz on the Boolean hidden matching problem and have been developed since then. The idea here is that if x is uniformly random in some subset of the Boolean cube, then in order to get a bound of this form on the distance to, to uniformity, one needs to prove strong upper bounds on the sum of squares of Fourier coefficients of, this, of the indicator of the set that x is uniformly random in. And the, these bounds have to be parameterized by the weight of the, by, by the Hamming weight of these Fourier coefficients. So this is our goal. We have a set which is the intersection of a1, a2, a3. Its indicator is the product of f1, f2, f3, and we want to understand the Fourier transform of this. Okay, good. So let me relate this problem to our component growing protocol, which is a good model for the proof. So let's just understand, what is the Fourier transform of the component growing protocol? So here's, uh, here's an example. Maybe my players created uh, two components so far, this uh, blue, orange, and red, and uh, this uh, red, and, uh, red and blue. Uh, let's think about the corresponding function h, that's the set that x is uniformly random in, and let's try to understand this uh, uh, Fourier transform. Well, first it turns out 
to be useful to not think about the Fourier transform H hat, but a certain normalized Fourier transform H tilde. Uh, so let me talk about just, uh, I'll replace all the hats with H tildes. This is just a convenient rescaling. Okay, so for the component growing protocol, the Fourier transform of the corresponding function turns out to have the following simple form, or at least the square of this uh, uh, function has a very simple form. The Fourier transform of a coefficient v, sort of note that this coefficient is just a subset of the nodes, is this. In absolute value, it's 1 if v has an even intersection with the components in the forest co uh, constructed by, uh, by the players so far, and is 0 otherwise. This is just the Fourier transform of a linear subspace. Okay. That's very nice. In particular, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's look at the amount of Fourier mass on the second level of the Fourier spectrum. That is, when the vertices, uh, when the coefficients that we're summing over have, cardin have Hamming weight exactly two. Basically, let's understand how much our protocol knows about pairs of uh, vertices. Uh, really, h tilde of v is the amount of knowledge that our protocol has about whether or not the vertices in v are on the same side of the bipartition. Okay, uh, one can convince oneself that the sum of squares of Fourier coefficients over coefficients of level two for the component growing protocol is nothing but the summation over all components of the size of the corresponding component choose two, which is exactly the potential function that I defined for the component growing protocol. That is, we sum the squares of, Fourier co of, of component sizes over all non-trivial coefficients. In other words, the potential function that governed the, com the behavior of the component growing protocol is actually the sum of squares of Fourier coefficients over, over the second level. And we need to bound this, such sums. OK, good. And so this motivates uh, the following proof plan. We note that our goal because we're using the, the Fourier machinery, is to understand the amount of mass on various levels of Fourier spectrum. And we just noted that for the component growing protocol, the corresponding amount of mass on the second level is exactly the potential function that we defined. And we convinced ourselves before that this potential function can at most grow exponentially with the number of players. So this is what we would like to do. We would like to prove for general protocols that the sum of squared Fourier coefficients over all elements of the second level of the, Fourier, of the spectrum is at most the communication times something that grows exponentially with, uh, with the number of, uh, number of players. OK, now, of course, we're working with general protocols. So the second level of the Fourier spectrum is not going to be enough. You need higher order equivalents of this. But higher order equivalents of this have a very natural form. Uh, so let's see if we can actually make this proof plan work. So, so far, it looks like we can view general protocols simply as a relaxation of this component growing protocol. So can I ask a question? Yes. So where in the assumption of the FIs are you using the fact that F2 should depend on F1 and F3 should depend on F1 and F2? So it's a one-way thing, right? And not yes. simultaneous. Yes. So how, maybe I missed that thought. OK, OK, good. So uh, yes, F1 definitely does depend. It, it, it does depend uh, on, uh, on F2. Uh, sorry, F2 depends on F1. It's not really exp Yeah, it, it, there are these dependencies. That is true. Uh, the place where they come up is in uh, basically bounding, basically in a few slides, a uh, couple of slides down the line. Basically, once we, you know, the, these definitions, as stated, uh, uh, yes, F2 depends on F1, F3 depends on F2, F4 depends on everything before that. In particular, this means that uh, um, when we bound the Fourier spectrum, we can't, for instance, have much independence between them. Right? Because uh, the third player might, for instance, easily adapt. If the third player knows that uh, the second player conveyed lot, put a lot of Fourier mass on uh, some elements of the spectrum, the third player might decide to put more Fourier mass there as well. That does come up, come up but, I, but I will not really talk much about it in this overview. Yeah. <coughs> Good. So what is our goal now? Um, our goal is this. So, so we have this uh, plan of basically emulating the component growing protocol. Now, we are interested in understanding the Fourier transform of this function h. What is this function h? T players have spoken. 
every player's message constrains x to be uniformly random on some subset whose indicator is the corresponding set ft. So ht is the product of the corresponding fts. We want to understand the Fourier transform of h hat t, and we want to use the structure of this function, the fact that it's a product of uh, functions over matchings. So we want to use something uh, inductive, basically. Uh, we start by proving the corresponding bounds for just the functions fts that, uh, that the player's messages correspond to. Uh, that turns out to be pretty easy. Uh, the reason is that these functions are supported on matchings, and that's where you get an improvement from the square root and bound and the Boolean hidden matching problem to a linear bound here. So that part is, is, is rather straightforward. Now, from here, what we want is to <laughs> lift these bounds on the FTs to a bound on HD. For that, we want to use the convolution theorem, because the uh, Fourier transform of a product of T functions is the uh, convolution of uh, corresponding Fourier transforms. Now, this idea of using the convolution theorem was recently used in our work with Kana Sudan and Wellinger, and recently with uh, John Callagher, uh, Eric Price. Uh, uh, but here, the situation is harder, because in both those works, the convolutions are basically a product. So they're a little bit easier than, than here, whereas in our setting, the convolution is uh, as, as general as it gets. OK, so the main technical contribution is exactly the analysis of this convolution for an arbitrarily large number of players. And uh, the challenge is the fact that the union of the matchings actually has a giant component. Uh, I still have maybe two minutes. Is that OK? Sure. Okay. Uh, good. It, it turns out, however, that uh, sort of while all prior works rely on L2 bounds on the Fourier spectrum, which comes out naturally from hypercontractivity, it turns out that L2 bounds are not uh, sufficient to carry the inductive hypothesis through. And uh, what we note is that L1 bounds is, uh, are sufficient, uh, substantially more robust. Uh, I don't have time to get into the details, but one can construct examples that show that uh, essentially to carry out the uh, induction, what we need to prove is that basically the Fourier spectrum is in some sense close to sparse. And uh, our way of arguing this is to upper bound the L1 norm of the Fourier coefficients on various levels of the spectrum, which turns out to be pretty small for a given L, L, L2 norm. So for the individual FTs, we first upper bound the Fourier transform, the, the, the squared norm from hyperconductivity, and then use Cauchy-Schwartz. This is exactly what, where it is important that the graphs given by the players are very sparse. They're basically matchings. That's where the improvement comes from. And after that, <coughs> we use the uh, we use the convolution, the convolution theorem. The high, uh, the high orders or the high level idea here turns out to be the following, that because of the sparsity of the graphs given, by the, <coughs> given to the individual players, we get stronger bounds on the individual FTs. And uh, in particular, if you look at the second level of the Fourier spectrum, we get exactly the behavior that we have for the component growing protocol. Uh, after that, Using the convolution theorem, we're able to show that even though the Fourier transform of this HT already does not have this nice structure, it's not supported on a matching, it still maintains this property that L1 norm is pretty small for the vector of the same of a given L2 norm, despite the fact that this HT could be supported in huge sets. <coughs> Good. Uh, so the other high level, or high order bit is that one can essentially think of our proof as a L1 relaxation of the zero order component gro gro growing protocol. Basically, one should compare a component growing protocol with space S to a general protocol with space square root of S times N that is slightly larger space. Good. So that's a, that's a summary of, uh, of the approach. We get an optimal lower bound for approximating max cut. The main idea is to upper bound the L1 norm of the Fourier spectrum as opposed to L2 norm which has been used in uh, all prior works. And uh, it would be very nice to see other applications of uh, L1 norm uh, bounds on the Fourier transform for graph problems, because this is uh, exactly the, uh, what, what makes this analysis work. Yeah. Um, maybe a quick question. I don't know, that's more Are there any multi-pass lower bounds for the problem? No, no, that would be very interesting. Especially given that I would, uh, yeah, I would not be too surprised if there was a, an efficient algorithm for, let's say, a logarithmic number of passes. That is, uh, I don't think a, lin a linear bound, I don't think, holds. For these instances, it's actually just not true. <laughs> <laughs>
So in order to allow a small break, let's, um, let's, let's thank Michael and take the rest of the questions off. <laughs> Next talk, Sam.